Darwinism and atheism or it's faith. It's one or the other. You can't right. pick both. Uh, yeah. that's, that's very much a false dichotomy. All right. So, Ben, before we get into some of these other issues here that I really want to cover, I wanted to kind of set the stage a little bit and uh, get from you an idea of the, the ancient Near Eastern uh, uh, background that would have been where the creation story may have come from, or at least what the people that were listening or reading this would have understood. What, what, how does that influence what we have in Genesis 1? Okay, so, well, um, the first thing I think to know would be that there wasn't just one creation story, there were multiple creation stories both among the Israelites and their neighbors. The Israelites probably knew at least three creation stories. One of those would be Genesis 1 through about chapter 2, verse 4. Mm -hmm. One of them would be what we think of as the Adam and Eve story, Genesis 2, 4 onwards. And then one of them is kind of scattered throughout the rest of the Old Testament in Isaiah, Job, Psalms, and actually shows up pretty clearly later in the New Testament in the book of Revelation. Uh, among Israel's neighbors, they also had multiple accounts, and they never tried to square them. They never tried to say, well, we've got this account and this account. How do we make a mesh? That doesn't seem to have been an issue for them, which is a hint that they thought about these differently than we do. They approached them differently than we do, but we don't have any explicit texts explaining from an Israelite perspective, here's what's going on in Genesis 1, and here's how I make sense of it. So we, okay. have, to, we have to try to recover that by as you've asked, what does the ancient Near East tell us about this? What would the Israelites have understood in here that isn't said explicitly? Okay. And so for Genesis 1, there is an awful lot because it's counterintuitive to us, but Genesis 1, as it appears in the Bible, is actually newer than Genesis 2 through 3. Genesis okay. 2 through 3 is older than Genesis 1. Is there any reason why we see Genesis 1 first? Uh, probably because it was easier to put them together in that order editorially than okay. the opposite order. Sure. I think. Uh, but that's pure supposition on my part. And uh, Genesis 1 draws on some of these older Israelite creation stories. There are some scholars who think that Genesis 1 is actually a rewrite or update of Genesis 2. Um, but it does draw on other creation texts in the Bible, like uh, Psalm 74 and Psalm 104, if I'm remembering correctly. Genesis 1, as we have it. And I say as we have it because it probably existed in oral form first before being written down. And as these earlier uh, I want to say traditions that doesn't mean anything about their validity or truth or anything like that, but, mm -hmm. um, and was put into the form we have it in by Israelite priests in Babylon as a counter response to the Babylonian theology that was being dumped on them by uh, being hauled off and stuck in Babylon. Okay. So let me clarify uh, a couple things here yeah, for some people. Yeah. So you're talking about Babylon. This would be right at the time of Lehi. He leaves and then, and then the, the Israelites are, are, or those in the, the kingdom of Judah are taken away from King Nebuch by King, King Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon, and they're there for an exile for about 70 years, right? Right. But what about anything being written before that? Uh, in other words, if you're, if we're, we believe, based on Bible scholarship, that this, these, these, these renditions, if you will, of, of Genesis well, are That's, that's are why I have to say, as exile, we have it. But... It's just what we have today. Right. It, it, it's not produced out of nothing in Babylon. It's drawing upon Israelite tradition to um, respond to pressing theological need. I mean, if you think about that, that's what we have in general conference. Mm 
when there's some new question, all of a sudden general authorities start looking back into LDS literature and previous general conferences and they start pulling up new quotes, new stories, focusing on new scriptures to apply to this new problem. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Israelite priests are doing in Babylon. They're saying, okay, we've got to counter this Babylonian theology and we've got to do it with these truths that God has given us. And Genesis 1, if you like, is kind of a tract against the Babylonian theology that is becoming very popular among the Israelites. Okay. So, so for an Israelite in Babylon who hears Genesis 1, he or she is going to pick up on a whole bunch of anti-Babylonian stuff that we will not pick up on. One, because they're there. <laughs> there is... Uh, and maybe, Ben, maybe yeah. even you have, you know, Israelites that are in Babylon that are being influenced by, right? They're, oh. be, they're, they're being influenced by the Babylonian religion. We know they were, because yeah. when they go back, uh, I don't remember how many years later, 100 years later, only a third of them go back. Mm -hmm. The rest of them are like, no, oh, we're fine in Babylon. This is great. Um, okay. And, uh, well, yeah. So... Um, we talked previously before we started recording about uh, that fireside I did at the DC Temple Visitor Center, where I bring up the example of um, Star Wars and the Phantom Edit. Mm -hmm. Do you remember seeing that? Yes, I do. Okay, that's, that's kind of the thing I'm talking about. The Israelites in Babylon, they have that background of a new militia to implicitly place Genesis 1 against. And that's what they're comparing it to. And the problem is most readers today have never even heard of Enuma Elish, let alone being familiar with it. And of course, if they are, they're familiar with it in English and Genesis in English. And so unless you're reading one of the explicit compare and contrasts, you simply do not pick up on the points of contrast that are intended to stand out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, if you've ever been with a toddler, you're constantly trying to keep their attention, right? And so you might point and say, look, a dog. And the toddler stares at your finger. Mm -hmm. You're like, not my finger, over there, over mm -hmm. there. And so when we read Genesis and we get focused on, well, how old is the earth? It's, it says six days, what does they mean? We're kind of like the toddler focusing on the finger because the dog is just not even in our peripheral vision. A good right? analogy, sure. And so one of the points I make elsewhere is that for almost 2,000 years, nobody could really understand Genesis literally the way the Israelites did at the time, simply because that information was lost to us. That contextual information was lost to us. We had to rediscover the Babylonian material in the late 1800s, have it translated, and have 100 years of scholars looking at it carefully before we really started to come to a mature view of what's the relationship between these things. Uh, because when the Babylonian material was first discovered by German Protestants especially, Germans were not particularly friendly to the Old Testament or Jews, late 1800s, early 1900s. Protestants in particular were not Old Testament friendly. And so they, they saw this stuff. They saw the deep similarities between them. And they said, oh, well, this is what the Jews stole Genesis from. Hmm. It was very anti-Semitic. And so it's taken decades to move beyond that to a less biased, more mature, less anti-Semitic view of what is the relationship between these texts? What were they doing? Which is and kind I of interesting. I don't want to give the impression that that is uh, Smith, because he just completely delves into the Old Testament. Yeah. On 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 restoration doctrine, but. So, uh, to give an example of one of these contrasts, and and I think this is one of the ones I use in that DC fireside as well. Um, in uh, in the Babylonian materials, you have these tiers of gods deities, lesser deities, supernatural beings, whatever you want to call them. And there's a, there's a tier of slave gods who exist solely to serve these high gods 
And the place of humans in existence is below the slave gods. It is, uh, what it says implicitly about humans in creation is that we're garbage, we have no point, life is terrible, and then you die. Uh, it's, it's not Rosie. very optimistic. <laughs> and so if that's what you're getting out of Babylonian stuff, well, you're an Israelite living in Babylon, and remember that they're struggling. Why did God allow his temple to be destroyed? Why have we been dragged out of the Holy Land? Why have our lives been uprooted? And then you hear Genesis 1, in which a single God, not a multiplicity of gods arguing with each other, creates the earth, and at the end of every day, it's good. Day two, it's good. Day three, it's good. Day four, it's good. And when humans get created on day six, the creation of humans is not just good, it's very good. Hmm. And so implicitly, what Genesis teaches about the place of humans in creation is that creation is good, and humanity is very good, not that we are below the slave mud gods and then we die. That's a very optimistic, very positive doctrine. And it's one of the things that these Israelite priests are trying to counter. One of the other ones, of course, is uh, polytheism. Uh, you know, in Babylon, you have these battles between gods and the main God could die and be replaced and they are kind of human and they are uh, whimsical in the sense that they do things to destroy people at random. And by contrast, that is not what the God of Genesis one, the God of the Israelites is portrayed as. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are a number of details in Genesis one that really stand out and make sense in contradistinction to what the Israelites are getting in Babylon. Okay. But if you're not aware of the Babylonian backdrop, you don't get any of that. Okay. And you know, actually a lot of religions and even going to Greek and Roman mythology, it's the same kind of idea. You have these, these, these chaotic uh, gods that succumb to the same kind of human passions that we do. And we're all victims. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that, that kind of is where this is. So you're, what you're saying here then is that when we look at Genesis and the creation story specifically, we are, we are looking at something that is intentionally contrasted against the Babylonian creation story. Absolutely. Would that, would that is there ways where that is um, going to dilute doctrine then? Uh, 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 that's an interesting question. Uh, my first impulse is to say no, because it depends what doctrine you think is being taught. Sure. And uh, if you think the doctrine that Genesis 1 is trying to teach is, again, about the age of the earth or evolution or things like that, then you might say, well, yes, this dilutes doctrine. Mm -hmm. But what I am trying to present is, I would argue very strongly, is a literal reading of Genesis. It is what Genesis intends to be taught. And if Genesis has no intention of saying anything definite about the age of the earth or evolution or things like that, then to look at those as the doctrines that are in there that I'm diluting is actually resting scripture. Yeah, I guess my question would be on things like, you know, Joseph Smith goes in and he pulls out of this, you know, in, in, in the King Follett discourse, for example, he, he talks about Elohim being a plurality. Right. Right. And, he, and things like that, where, you know, I'm just wondering if there were perhaps some, some places that's been looked at in, in what we have now as Genesis, where we can see maybe there were some changes. Are, are you familiar with Margaret Barker? Uh, yes. Okay. okay. So she goes into the, that kind of thing a lot, right? Where she'll go through right. and she can show that through the, the, uh, uh, Aramaic now type script of Hebrew, where you can make points and, and, and small little changes. And so she, that's a big thing of what she does and, and talks about how things yeah. have been changed through well, tribal tradition. I take Barker with a heavy grain of salt, mostly because uh, on one or two occasions where I have checked her claims, they have what she says about the text is not accurate. Okay. So she's, she's a very interesting and provocative scholar who's worth reading. But uh, my response in the past has been, I hope she's right, but she hasn't done the work to support her conclusions. Okay. 
Well, she's, she's stretching a bit. She does stretch. I think, I think what she does, just on a little tangent here, because I've read most everything she's written. And it seems to me that, you know, being LDS, obviously, it seems to me like she's on the right track. But um, she, it's kind of like a, uh, um, you know, she's throwing all the spaghetti up against the refrigerator. Yeah. Seeing what sticks sometimes. Yeah. Because you know, a lot of what she does, at least in biblical scholarship, is kind of new. But, um, okay, so this, this ancient background, you, know, you brought up literal things that are looked yes. at literally. Now, you have said in the past that, you, know, you want, why don't you explain to us what you mean by literal, a literal reading? So most often today when people say a literal reading, by that they mean kind of a plain language reading. This is, I look at the English and this is what it says. And claims that it means something else are uh, avoiding the obvious and clear meaning of the text. Mm -hmm. And that's a literal interpretation. And the problem with that is, uh, well, there are several problems with that. Um, the main problem has to do with the idea that a plain text, context-free English reading of the text is sufficient to know what the text means and that that is a literal reading. So let me, let me go with this backwards. So uh, if you go back to Augustine in the fourth century, he writes multiple volumes on the book of Genesis that he calls a literal interpretation of Genesis. And what he means when he says that, um, and it's in Latin, it's actually where we get the word literature from, ad literam. What he means is not face value. What he means is according to the author's intention. Mm. And if you read Catholic and Jewish and Protestant scholars today, the meaning of literal for the last 2,000 years of scriptural interpretation has meant according to the author's intention. That is, uh, a literal reading of a poem requires recognizing that it's a poem. The okay. content of the poem may or may not be about a historical event, right? Uh, uh, you know, in Flanders Field is a poem, but it's about World War I. Right. And a literal reading of uh, fiction or historical fiction must recognize that it is fiction or historical fiction. And the thing about historical fiction is, I can write historical fiction about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln's a real guy, but if I recognize that it's historical fiction, I'm also going to say, okay, he didn't actually do these things in this book. So uh, this is basically genre. We have to recognize what kind of thing a text or a movie is in order to understand its information correctly. When you say this is this is a genre, what are you what are you referring referring to? Uh, well, so wh when I'm saying things like poem or historical fiction, those are genres. Okay. And the problem is that Latter Day Saints have often approached Scripture with this false dichotomy of literal or figurative, where literal means it's a history and happened this way, and figurative means, uh, you know, it's a metaphor, it's an analogy. And the problem is that that kind of dichotomy simply doesn't map onto scripture any more than it maps onto uh, Netflix or restaurants or books or movies. I mean, is Star Wars literal or figurative? Well, based on what you're saying, it's literal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have asked that question before in, in gospel doctrine classes, and usually people are kind of puzzled. One, well, it's science fiction. I say, okay, you recognize that that kind of false dichotomy simply doesn't apply. You have to know what kind of thing it is. And so if we are going to engage in a literal reading of Genesis, that means we have to engage in some work to figure out what kind of genre is Genesis, what does it mean in context, what did the author intend to say? How did they intend to write? And that's not the kind of thing that comes through in a translated, context-free, surface reading. Um, and if, if that seems odd to you, think about other specialized texts. If you take, you know, Joe Schmo, who might be very intelligent and well-read, but give him uh, the Constitution and say, 
what does, uh, I'm not a constitutional guy by any means, but you know, what does amendment 15 mean? Write me up 40 pages on it. If he doesn't know the, the historical context and all that other stuff, he may be able to expound on it a little, but he's generally not going to capture the intent of the constitutional authors, the historical things that gave rose to the need for that amendment, how it was passed. A literal reading requires expertise. Okay. Expertise in history and ancient languages and things like that. So when I say I am giving a literal interpretation of Genesis, I honestly believe I am giving a literal interpretation of Genesis as literal as it can be. That doesn't mean I think Genesis is history or science. It's very clearly not. But I'm not, I'm not, uh, if you read Young Earth Creationists, their claim is that, uh, you know, Genesis teaches Young Earth Creationism and anything else, any other interpretation is just trying to avoid what the text very clearly says. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, no, it doesn't very clearly say that. Thank you. I'll take my Hebrew and my history of interpretation, and that's not what it means. Yeah, so it's, it's not the intent, in other words. Now, you said certain genres. What genre, then, is Genesis 1? Uh, well, I do not know that we have a modern genre that maps perfectly onto what the Israelites might have categorized it as. Hmm. And when I teach institute and I have time to you know, say I have an hour with the class, they know me, they've read some of my stuff. I have time to set up certain frameworks. And uh, there is a Greek word that refers to stories that make sense of the past. Um, sorry, they, not that they make sense of the past. They make sense of the present without any regard for whether it actually happened or not. Mm. And that word has come into English as myth. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with modern usage of myth is we say, oh, that's a myth, meaning that's false, that never happened, that's not the way things work. But uh, there are historians and philosophers of science and biblical scholars who say, well, in this sense, science is a myth. Because what science does is it tries to come up with stories that fit the facts as we understand them to explain what we see in the world around us. Mm -hmm. That is a myth. And so Genesis 1 is looking at the world around the Israelites as it's been destroyed by the Babylonians and hauled off. And they are trying to make sense of that in light of the facts as they understand them and to teach certain things. I've already kind of been going over. Mm -hmm. So when I say Genesis is a myth, it has very narrow and technical meaning that if I just got up in Sunday school and said, Genesis is a myth, you know, I'd get mobbed. Sure, sure. Uh, but when I have time to set it up correctly, it's, it's not a problem. Um, story is kind of the same way if we say story, because, you know, if you sit your kids down and say, let me tell you a story, it might be about grandpa and his mission, or it might be, uh, you know, Aesop's fables. Story yeah, doesn't it. mean anything either way. That's usually the term I use. It, I, I guess I haven't found a better one. I usually say I usually say the creation story and yeah. the Garden of Eden story. Yeah, Myth because that leaves open everything open for me. <laughs> yeah, and for whoever I'm talking to. So you mentioned a couple of words here that for some people they're they're going to, you know, wait a minute. What are you saying, Ben? You know, <laughs> first of all, you said historical fiction. Right. Right. So with historical fiction, someone may say, right? You, you've got a spectrum of of believers. Right where some are going to say, okay, what we usually use as the term literal, right, which I'll say face value, as you, as you said, yeah. a lot of people are going to take Genesis 1 as, and, and the Garden of Eden story at face value. That, and they're going to interpret it in the way that we would do it today in a modern, mostly Western, scientific environment. Yeah, post-enlightenment, post-scientific. Post-enlightenment, absolutely. And so, yeah. On the other end of the spectrum, you might have people that are atheist and, and or, or or are, hey, the, the entire Bible is written as a myth, right? The, the entire Bible is written as uh, uh, a moral type of fake history 
that is uh, not rooted in anything real at all. It's just something that can be put together as, as a moral guide, right? So when you say historical fiction and use the word myth, yeah, what would you say to those people on those two ends of the spectrum about that? So let's start on the, on the atheist spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's go with Dawkins, right? Okay. Uh, Richard Dawkins says, we know the Bible is false because the things in Genesis don't match science. Excuse me. In some ways, he's committing the same fallacy that young earth creationists are. He's right. assuming that for Genesis to be true, it has to be scientific and it has to be accurate. Mm-hmm. And those are, those are recent assumptions of the last couple hundred years. And, and he's I, a scientist. A that's that's a that. natural thing for him. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the believing end, um, some of this is just deep familiarity with scripture and the way history gets written. Uh, one of my email sign-offs is from a Jewish professor of Hebrew and comparative literature at Berkeley named Robert Alter. And he says, history is much closer to fiction than we have been inclined to assume. Uh, a lot of people assume that history is a cold collection of facts and things as they really were. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that history writing, which is called historiography, uh, you can study how history is written. That's called historiography. Um, has often changed a lot and it does have a lot more in connection with fiction than we would like to think. And here's what I mean. Um, if I am writing about, uh, you know, my dad's mission 50 years ago, I have a very limited amount of data available to me. Right. And so if I am actually going to tell a story to my kids, well, I don't have kids. I'm, this is a for instance. Sure. If I'm going to tell a story to my kids about my dad's mission, and I have very limited data, there are some connecting details that I have to fill in. I will fill them in based on, well, it was 50 years ago, so he probably doesn't have an iPhone, and he's in France, so they're probably speaking French. They're going to be likely details. They're going to be, uh, what's the term for this? Um, I can only remember the French term, which is strange. Uh, historians have a term for this, uh, uh, which is basically how realistic is it? How likely is it? Um, you know, if, if in my dad's mission story, he encounters uh, Harry Potter, right? That's, that's not going to be a realistic detail of his mission in France 50 years ago. Sure. Obviously not. But the fact that I have to fill in those details makes it slightly fictional, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, um, John S. Tanner, who is both a former BYU professor and he used to be, I believe, the General Sunday School Board president, has an article talking about this in which he says, fiction comes from Latin fictia, which means something shaped, something made. And the fact that historians always have a limited amount of data means that they are always taking that data and they are arranging it, they are filling in the gaps according to what they think is most realistic. Now that's modern history. Go back to the ancient Israelite writers where they don't have that idea of history and they are inclined to um, fill in more gaps to make certain things more obvious. And this becomes very clear when we are reading the parallel stories between, say, Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, which repeats. Chronicles starts over with Adam mm -hmm. and brings it up to King Saul and David and things. And then it tells some of these stories different ways to make different points. Some of the stories it leaves out entirely. Um, and then, of course, in these stories, you have conversations between historical characters. Um, so, you know, David says to Saul, and then Saul says back to David, they did not have a scribe with them taking down Hebrew shorthand. Sure. Almost all Bible scholars, including the very conservative evangelical ones, say almost all conversations in Scripture have been fictionalized, simply because that is the nature of conversation. I mean, how well, 
so in the Book of Mormon, think about this. How do we have um, Abinadi's preaching, which is presented in quotation marks? Who gives that to us? Well, that would have to be Alma. And how did Alma get them? Well, he's got a really, really, really good memory. Yeah, he was present <laughs> as a hostile witness. Right. And then had to flee. And while he is under pressure, weeks, maybe months later, he writes down a Benedict sermon. Mm -hmm. Now, if I take, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, but let's say I take uh, a teenager who's not excited about church and uh, the bishop gives a talk. And two months later, I go to that teenager and I say, I want you to write down word for word the bishop's talk. It's either going to be really, really fragmentary, or a lot of it is going to be the teenager filling in those gaps and saying, well, this is the general gist that I remember him doing, but it's going to be presented as if it were a transcript, verbatim. Mm -hmm. And so when I say historical fiction, these stories that we read in things like Samuel and, and Chronicles and things, by necessity are going to be fictionalized to some extent because they have to be. That's the nature of history writing 3,000 years ago in Israel. Sure. That's just the way things are. Well, you'd also have to consider that, that uh, you know, most people are illiterate. And is this written differently so that people can remember it better? Is there, is there poetry? Is there, you know, what, what's yeah. used here as far as literary devices? Yeah, there is, there is a anything? reason why the major prophets and the minor prophets um, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the, the 12 minor prophets, Amos, and so on, why they are in poetry. Mm -hmm. And that is because they were delivered orally. Uh, they were spoken, and people heard them. And the Hebrew poetry is done in such a way that it helps things stick in your mind. Um, there is repetition, that parallelism, uh, you know, A and then A prime, uh, listen to the words of your father. Do not ignore the sayings of your mother, is mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm -hmm. So every idea you get twice repeated in a slightly different way. Right. Those things were meant to help stick in people's heads because most people couldn't read. Most people couldn't write. It had no point. It mm -hmm. was a very specialized skill that didn't have a lot of application back then. Right. Um, but those stories in Kings and Chronicles and Samuel tend to have to do with the kings who would have had royal scribes to preserve royal records and things like that. And that's where we get a lot more of really the historical portion of the Old Testament, mm -hmm. where you have that, that, uh, the scribes available. Back yeah. to Genesis real quick. What, okay. what then is, uh, if we call this myth, if we call this historical fiction, what is the point then of Genesis 1 if we're not talking about what we would think of in a a modern scientific mind, if we're not talking about the how, the, how, how we came to be and how the earth came to be? Well, I think the point for the Israelites would have been huge. And that primary point is not so much for us. Uh, there are very few, at least Western Latter-day Saints, who are confronted on a daily basis with the overwhelming logic for uh, polytheism. Um, that is, if one of the main points of Genesis 1 is who actually created the world and is creation good and what is our place in it. For Babylonians, that was a chaotic polytheist idea. Mm -hmm. And we know that polytheism was extremely attractive to Israelites because it had a very strong cultural logic. And that cultural logic no longer holds for us. Let me give an analogy. Uh, and I've I've used this somewhere else, so it might be familiar, but you know, imagine you move into a new apartment or a new condo and you meet the landlord and you say, okay, well, you know, we're new in town. Who's our electrical company that we need to set up with? He says, oh, that's me. Ah, okay. Okay, what about water? Who do we turn on water and gas with? Oh, I do the water and gas too. I'm that company. Okay, garbage recycling, also you? Yep, that's also me. Uh, internet? Oh, I, I do the internet. For ancient people, uh, Egyptians, 
Babylonians, Assyrians, Sumerians, Hittites, pretty much everyone we know of in the ancient Near East, Israelites, neighbors. There were different tiers of gods and what we would think of as nature. Each of those things was overseen or embodied by a particular deity. Uh, fertility, the sun rising, crops, uh, health, war. There were all these deities that did these things. And the idea that only one deity would be in control of all of this was just as ludicrous to them as this would be for us to move into a new condo and be like, really? One guy is doing the electricity and the plumbing and the recycling and the internet and the gas and is my, no, that, that makes no sense at all. Now, especially for the Israelites because they had just seen a proxy theology war. That is, Israel was the Holy Land. Jerusalem was the holy city in the Holy Land. The Temple Mount was the holiest part of Jerusalem, and the Temple was the holiest bit. And when different groups went to war with each other, it was seen as their deities are fighting. And whoever wins, that's because their deity is the greater deity. So the fact that Jerusalem has just been destroyed, the Temple has been destroyed, here we are in Babylon being taught this polytheistic stuff, it looks like Jehovah is not really a God at all. It's the Babylonian polytheism stuff. And Genesis 1 is written very, very strongly to counter that. But we do not live in a polytheist society today. And so that's not a very compelling point to us. That's not something we feel like we need to hear in church and have reinforced regularly every Sunday, right? Because right. it's not like, it's not like our, our teenage kids come home from school and they're like, you know, I think I believe in six or 12 different gods now, not just one. You know, there's, there's the one controlling the sun and there's the one controlling the weather. I don't believe in this one God thing. Those sure. are not the concerns our teenage kids bring home to their parents. But the general point that creation is good, that the God of heaven is in control, and that humanity has a definite and important place within creation those are things that can still be very relevant to Latter-day Saints and non-Latter-day Saints today, even if the specific Babylonian anti-Polytheus stuff isn't mm -hmm. particularly relevant to us. Okay. And what we have to remember, DNC 124 teaches this, God speaks to our need. And what that means is if our need in 2020 is different than the need in 2720, people who are reading General Conference from 2020 will go, I don't understand this. Why are they even talking about this? Why is this an issue? Mm -hmm. And the needs of the Israelites at that time, God spoke to those needs. Those are no longer our needs. Okay, so here's one thing, though, I would ask on that. Okay. It is at the core today of our temple worship. Right. So as far as needs today why why would we why would we have the creation story in the temple uh because of what i call the principle of adaptation um that is uh, and this will date me a little but you know uh i think you'll get it i don't know about younger listeners but older ones will mm -hmm. in some sense god is like macgyver or the a-team mm -hmm. and that he takes what is available and readapts it for a new purpose. He transforms it. Um, I don't think Genesis as given to the Israelites in Babylon has the same meaning as the temple intends it for us because it has been reappropriated and adapted for a new and much more relevant purpose. Uh, God has MacGyvered it, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, which is not to say it's totally unconnected, because it's not. We know that among the Israelites, Genesis 1 was recited during particular animal sacrifices in the temple, in the Israelite temple. Um, and I think setting adaptation aside, or maybe expounding on what purpose it serves, I think what we get in the creation is a narrative context that is a macrocosm. That is, we start pre-mortal existence, pre-creation. And that narrative takes us through creation, through life, all the way up through death and re-entering God's presence. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it is very natural for a inspired temple ceremony that needed that macrocosm to bring in the creation narrative from the Bible, especially since it was echoed in Moses and Abraham. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've talked about those things at length elsewhere. Um, But I, I think if we go to the temple expecting to be taught new and secret facts about history and science in creation, or at least uh, things of that nature, I think we're really looking beyond the mark. We're looking in the wrong direction. We're looking at the finger instead of what the finger's pointing at. Mm-hmm. Um, now, it seems to me uh, that, could, that, that, so for example, here, here's how I kind of see this now. Can, we're, we're jumping a little bit ahead, but. Sure, sure. It's, it, it wouldn't be surprising. This is, uh, you know, supposition to some degree, well, to a large degree on my end. Oh, this is all supposition. Yeah, but, sure. but. <laughs> Well, you've got Moses, who's at the head of a dispensation. Right. You've got Abraham, who's at the head of a dispensation. And you've got Joseph Smith, who's at the head of a dispensation. What is the purpose of writing these things over and over again and, and, and showing that this is there? See, to me, I, I, it makes me feel like it is applicable, right? It, it makes me feel like for whatever reason that, that we don't maybe quite grasp all the time or ever, this is core to our religion. And, and, and when a new dispensation is brought in, and again, as I've said to you previously, I, th- there's a vision that's given. And, and that vision is of the creation. And when I say a vision of the creation, when I, when I, I look at this like this is a vision. And, and this is something that is written down from a vision. It's not written down to say, hey, I want to try and explain everything, although it does to some degree in some ways and, and lays down some eternal truths. But to me, it is simply temple liturgy, right? It is, it is Moses goes up on Sinai. He has the vision. Uh, some writings, even uh, uh, apocalyptic or uh, apocryphal writings, have him up there seven days. right. Right, where he's up seven days, and, and okay, so each one of these days he's up there, he, he has a new part of this vision for seven days. But you know, regardless, it's a vision that I think he sees, right? And then and then Abraham, we're told, where before he ever gets into all the Kolob stuff, he's looking through the Urim and Thummim. And what you end up with Kolob, and uh, I'm gonna poorly pronounced it, but obelish or whatever that is in the coca beam and all those, right? They are representations of the cosmos. And to me, a representation of priesthood and of hierarchy. Okay. And that's a lot of what you get at the very beginning of the temple experience. Right. Although that's been removed quite a bit now, but but, you know, that, that whole idea of hierarchy is just hammered in over and over again to the point where you're like, why are we doing this over and over again? You know, and yet that's kind of what you get with that. And he's in a vision when he sees that. He's not writing down as Clark or others have written down in, in some of their writings, as, you know, some type of a, 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 a non-heliocentric type of a... a uh, you know, a cosmos. He's not doing that. He's, he's writing down a vision, I think. He's writing down what he sees, and this is symbolic. It's the same idea of what we get with Lehi's vision, right? When I, I don't think most members of the church, and I use that because everyone's familiar with it, believe that there is actually a place, a geographic place, where people are grabbing onto a rod and, and, and walking up to a tree of life. And on the other side of this big gulf, there is a big and spacious building that's lifted right. up, right? And yet, there are real characters, real people in it, mm-hmm. right? There are Lehi, Sariah, Laman, Lemuel, Nephi, Sam, right? They're real people that are in it. And, but it's a vision. And to me, it's a temple vision. I see that as a, the chiasmus of Genesis 1 and, and, the, and the Garden of Eden story. In other words, it's the second half. So if I go to, uh, 
uh, you know, Second Nephi two, yeah, where there's a lot of Lehi's verbiage on on the creation. He says um, Adam fell, right? So let's count that as an A to a B. Okay. That men might be and move it over to B again here, and men are that they might have joy and move that back up to an A. To me, the A to the B is the Garden of Eden story. It's the fall. Okay. Right? And then the chiasmus on that, the second half of that coming back up is Lehi's vision, where, where he's going from, well, you've fallen, but now you're moving back to the tree of life. Instead of in the Garden of Eden where you're, you're throwing in the, uh, the cherubim there to stop him, right? And, and so you have a vision there that is revealed, and why would that need to be revealed? I, and to me, it seems like it's this is because this is the core. This is everything, and, and this is what we're going to do in the temple. And if you look at the Psalms, and you have all of these uh, references to creation and to what I would say is a drama, mm-hmm. um, a, a, a definite drama that it, you know probably initiates with a procession, ends up at the at the uh, at the temple, and everybody participates. You know, kind of like with King Benjamin's speech. And, and so it's taken from a vision into a drama. And, and that is something that allows everybody to participate and to remember because they're not taking home leaflets necessarily. Right. They're not, they don't have the book at home. And in the beginning is more of something like the opening of the curtain. Okay. Right. And so uh, I, I, what, what I'm trying to get at is I, I, I don't, it just seems to me that in some way, in each dispensation, the same thing becomes very applicable, even in ours. I think God has to speak to different generations in different ways. Mm-hmm. And that may mean reappropriating things from the past and teaching different things with it, or that may mean something new entirely. Um, I do like thinking of the temple as liturgy. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it's, it's obviously liturgy, but I say that because uh, most Latter-day Saints are not familiar with the term liturgy. Right. We're vaguely familiar with ritual, but we, we have a tradition of not liking that because that's, that's a Catholic thing. And we don't do that until we go to the temple. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, we do that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Huh. We do that? We do that. Um, but I think as you're kind of getting at, once we start thinking about the temple in terms of liturgy and ritual, what is that designed to teach? What is it designed to accomplish? And those things are pretty deeply embedded in the Old Testament, uh, although not so much in Genesis. Genesis is kind of the clothing that that wears, I think. Hmm. Um, But if, if, Speaking to Latter-day Saints, if I were asked to try to characterize the temple briefly, I would say that the purpose of the temple is to provide a narrative context for us to make covenants as priests and kings, which symbolize uh, power and holiness united. And then those covenants enable us to do a ritual ascent into God's presence. And it's a macrocosm that starts in the beginning, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away mm-hmm. before creation and takes us all the way up past the moment of death, even though that's not explicit in the temple. Um, that's the purpose of the temple. Covenants that turn us into priests and kings, queens and priestesses. The things we see in there are a narrative context um, by which I mean... We could go in and just make covenants. Baptism has no narrative context. You go in, you get baptized, there's a talk, you're done. We could do that in the temple. But the temple uses the Old Testament to provide a narrative context to give uh, both past. It brings meaning from the past and points a path to the future for what those covenants can do uh, gives us that narrative. And I think, I think there are things in the temple itself that tell us 
uh, it's not a documentary. It's not a reenactment per se. Mm -hmm. But for me, at least, the first time I went to the temple, I was a little confused when I was like, oh, there's a movie. Oh, the movie ends, but we're not done. Um, and I guess part of the issue is I thought I was watching something happen. Mm -hmm. And the reality in the temple is we are participants in the drama. You know, they, they break the fourth wall. We are as Adam and Eve, they are us. And so that narrative that we're watching, that's us on the screen. And the narrative continues, even though the, the movie is over. Yeah. I think there's one thing that in, just in my discussions with other people that have that temple goers is, is that one thing that you said is, is the most important thing for, for many people to understand is that you are not watching history. Yeah. Right. You, the, the, and this, this takes everything from Genesis one and two, you know, and, and it's, it's like, this is not, this is not about the history of the world and its creation and about the history of man. That doesn't mean elements of that aren't in there. And that doesn't mean the true characters aren't in there, just like Lehi and Sarai in, in, the, in, in Lehi's vision, in his dream. Yeah. But it's you, you know, you're the one in Lehi's vision that needs to grab onto the iron rod. And in that sense, uh, you know, the story is told in President Hinckley's biography by Sherry Dew about how in the 1950s they were building the church in Switzerland, the first one outside the U.S., and they had this technical problem of how do we do this to people in a dozen languages? And it was President Hinckley who came up with the idea of doing film with different languages, right? Okay. But I think in some sense, having the temple presented to us with a film, especially now a film with music and special effects, misleads us into thinking, I'm watching a movie, and moreover, I'm watching a documentary. Yes. As opposed to, I am participating in a ritual drama. I think without a film, if you go to a live session at Salt Lake, or I think they're live at St. George too still, aren't they? If you go to a live session, it feels much more participatory than yes. uh, the typical presentation. But the typical presentation allows people to be in there taking it in in Spanish and Tagalog and French and English all at the same time. So everything has advantages and disadvantages. They're well, even the recent changes are probably something along the same lines as far as being able to get out to different languages and cultures, et cetera. But I was going to bring up also Genesis 1 then, to me, I mean, if you look at that without a movie, it's a drama, right? I, I see it as, I see, I, and I think that we make the mistake that when we see in the beginning, in Genesis 1, 1 at the very beginning, that this is supposed to be the beginning of everything, the beginning right. of creation, the beginning of existence, whatever. And, and yet yeah. if we realize beginning that, uh, that translation is highly contested among biblical scholars yeah uh, that that uh, a number of bibles and biblical scholars myself included prefer the translation uh, something along the lines of when god began creating the heavens and the earth which is a merism for everything when god yeah. began creating everything mm -hmm. the earth was formless and void it was uh uh what are the terms that they use Formless and void in Hebrew is a tohu vavohu. It's a nonce word, like right. a fuzzy wuzzy. Tohu vohu. <laughs> they and still so, use that in, in, in Israel today. Oh, but, oh that's right. Well, you know, yeah. if there's something really all messed up, it's, it's bohu. It's higgledy piggledy. Yeah. Um, some translators have tried to capture that with uh, like wild and waste. Mm. Uh, it's not so much that it's empty, it's that it's purposeless, it's, it's formless, it hasn't been given its, uh, its point yet. Right. Um, drawing heavily on John Walton and his ideas about functional creation. I'll have to look which him I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but... No, I'm not. Um, John Walton's series on the lost world of Genesis 1 and the lost world of Genesis 2 through 3, he's an evangelical Bible scholar. Uh, I reviewed his book for the Mormon interpreter a couple of years ago. Okay. But his, his take on Genesis 1 is very interesting and also highly disputed, where he says the problem for modern people is we think of creation in terms of physicality. Something exists when you can touch it and poke at it and move it around. Mm -hmm. And he says there's good evidence from the Bible and the ancient Near East that for these ancient people, existence 
was not physicality, but having a purpose and a name. And so you could actually go touch something that didn't exist, hmm. like the desert. The desert is described in Jeremiah as bohu, or tohu, rather, because it, you can't grow anything there. It doesn't do anything. It's just it's functionless. So from Walton's perspective, when God creates, it doesn't have anything to do with matter. It has to do with, um, use the analogy of programming a computer. Your computer's already there. It's built. God is giving it the software and turning it on. Mm. Uh, he calls this functional creation as opposed to physical creation. So does he believe in creatio ex nihilo? Uh, he does, but he doesn't get it out of Genesis 1. Okay. It comes out of uh, Proverbs and Psalms, and some other things. But. Okay. Well, let me move here and move us along yeah. a little bit because I want to make sure we get into some of this other stuff that, you, that you've really focused on in your research and, 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 uh, and study here. And that is, that is uh, science versus Genesis. Right. And, and looking at that throughout the history of the church. Yeah. Right. So going back to the time of Joseph Smith, I don't know if you've looked closely at that or... You know, as you go through time in the church and you have other, you know, Parley P. Pratt and, and uh, coming up to Talmadge and, and B.H. Roberts and Richards and, and then you get into something maybe a little different, right? Where you start going into Joseph F. Smith and Bruce R. McConkie and yeah. Joseph Fielding Smith. And uh, boy, how much time do we have? I would not. <laughs> yeah. um, so if we, if we just capsulate that a little bit, you have mostly people that are have a scientific background, starting off more in the 19th to early 20th century. Right. Then you have those that aren't, that, that start to say just a few different things. And by the way, those books, people don't realize sometimes, you know, Mormon doctrine, doctrines of salvation, questions to gospel, uh, what is that? Answers to Answers gospel. Answers to gospel questions. Yeah, questions. Yeah. I, I don't know about the latter on that, but, but most of those were not written by prophets, so to speak. They were not prophets when they wrote them. At least. In fact, I think Mormon doctrine, I don't think Bruce R. McConkie was He even was a an 70 yet. and that was published. Yeah. And obviously disputed among the brethren too. Right. But uh, but where just you know, just we don't need to go into all of their 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 uh, uh, what they've taught or or written about, but can you give us a kind of a basic idea of the narrative of of science versus uh, uh yeah. fundamentalism we'll call it or face value at, at uh, so I'm, I'm much much stronger there with 20th century lds history than the late okay let's go there let's go there because that's what my dissertation is on um pretty much every latter-day saint interpreter i have ever read uh late 19th century up to the present makes an assumption which is uh, unjustifiable and was culturally inherited. And this assumption is called concordism. That is, this assumption concordism assumes that what Genesis is trying to convey is facts of a scientific nature. Now, it might be doing it in metaphorical or poetic terms, mm -hmm. but it's facts about natural history and the physical origins and history of the earth. Um, and I have, uh, I have a video presentation I did at UVU a couple of years ago, kind of about the history of Concordism and where it came from and why it's rejected by a lot of Bible scholars today. But uh, pretty much all Latter-day Saint interpreters have gone with the idea that Genesis and Moses and Abraham and so on are speaking about the physical origins of the earth. Uh, in the early 20th century, you do have people like Witzow and Talmadge and uh, Joseph F. Merrill, who's less well known, um, who was also a formally trained scientist, um, who see things differently than Joseph Fielding Smith. They do not share all of his assumptions, although they do share concordism with him. And uh, they spend a lot of time arguing, a good bit of it in public, actually. Um, Joseph Fielding Smith thinks that scripture is very clear that the earth is young, uh, that there is no death anywhere before 6,000 years ago. And uh, in 1931, the first presidency formally says, 
We have no doctrine on death before 6,000 years ago or death before the fall. We have no doctrine, pro or con, on the existence of humans or humanoids before Adam. Um, but they, they are all reading scripture a little bit differently because they have slightly different lenses, interpretive assumptions that they're reading it through. And um, James E. Talmadge and B.H. Roberts, who was not a trained scientist, but also read differently than Joseph Fielding Smith, they both die in 1932. And Witso and Merrill, the two scientific apostles, die in 1952. Um, Talmadge dies in 33, not 32. I'm getting my date slightly wrong. But. And then in 1954, so two years after the death, Fielding publishes his Man, His Origin, and Destiny, which was a manuscript he had written decades earlier and finally did not have opposition in the quorum and he publishes it. And in that book, he takes a very hard perspective that the testimony of the prophets are absolute facts. Because when God speaks to a prophet, that prophet is basically getting a view from the divine encyclopedia. And so he read scripture as if it were science. And he made some small concessions on the side to, well, of course there are metaphors and parables, but he didn't really believe in genres. He didn't really accept, um, let me rephrase. He argued very strongly, assumed very strongly that plain reading was all that was necessary. We didn't need languages, we didn't need history. As long as the language was sufficiently clear, that's all we needed to interpret scripture. And on that basis, uh, Genesis and other LDS scripture required honest believers to accept a young earth. And uh, the death of dinosaurs in the flood and a whole bunch of other things like that. Well, um, from the 50s through the 80s, Smith's views are very, very influential. Uh, they're amplified by his son-in-law, McConkie. And because of some changes around that time, that's when correlation really comes into being and starts kind of standardizing church stuff. Their views become de facto orthodoxy. Uh, about We're still a little bit in that, aren't we? I mean, I mean, if someone goes out and starts to really say, okay, I'm going to start really studying the gospel. Now, Mormon doctrine, not so much anymore because it's out of print. <laughs> but... It's their their like, assumptions dominate the church, even yeah. though they're not attached to their names. They yeah. dominate the way we teach kids scripture in seminary, the way we write our manuals about scripture. They are pervasive. It's what's repeated. Yeah. Um, and so, well, let me cut out a lot. So when I make my presentations about interpreting scripture and what Genesis means and evolution, I have been somewhat surprised to find as warm a reception as I have among professional seminary institute teachers, uh, BYU professors, and so on. Um, it, it, there is also a good bit of pushback from very conservative or traditional people who tend to hold to kind of Simple assumptions about, well, God speaks to a prophet, so it's true, so it's fact, so why are you rejecting Joseph Fielding Smith? And I say, read the history. The first presidency rejected Joseph Fielding Smith. Talmadge and Witso and apostles rejected Joseph Fielding Smith on these things. There is no settled doctrine on this. There is tradition that's been really strong since the 50s. But um, I have been very surprised at how well people respond because it helps them make sense of things. It helps them make sense of Genesis and the temple. It helps them make sense of the history. And it means that evolution and science in general don't become nearly as much of a stumbling block as uh, Smith and McConkie and some others thought they were. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I am not, uh, I spend a lot of time talking about evolution in church history, not because I am a great defender of evolution. I don't really study evolution as a scientific topic. I studied it as a theological and historical topic that is connected to fundamentalist and uh, inerrantist assumptions people make about prophets. Mm -hmm. So I'm mostly trying to remove evolution and science as a stumbling block to faith, as opposed to arguing that they must be true and you must believe them because this is what science says. And would you say that, that, that 
that tradition that is more fielding and McConkey, it's also couched in a broader Western, especially, well, just Christian uh, 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 tradition, which is, which is, you know, it's Darwinism on one side and, and it's the Bible on the other. Yeah. It's Darwinism and atheism or it's faith. It's one or the other. You can't right. pick both. Uh, yeah. that's, that's very much a false dichotomy. There are numerous extremely devout Christians who are also highly uh, lauded scientists. I mean, the head of the National Institute of Health right now, whose name escapes me, but he's the guy who mapped the human genome. He's an evangelical Christian who has written books about Darwin and evolution. It is possible to square these things, but our tradition has not shown us how that's possible. And I'm, I'm trying to recover some of that. Now, how did this happen very briefly? Uh, and I'm giving a very, very simplified version here, but among other things, Joseph Fielding Smith read Christian fundamentalists, uh, Seventh-day Adventists. Way back in 1926, he's already pushing some of these books by Christian fundamentalists and Seventh-day Adventists on his fellow apostles, uh, especially people like Witso and Talmadge. And we have letters back and forth between them where they are reading these books and they're saying, it was a good defense of the Christian faith, and that's wonderful. But their claims about geology and biology are not well-founded. One of the ways that these guys differed is in what is called the demarcation problem, uh, which is a thing in history and philosophy of science. That is, how do you demarcate, how do you distinguish science from pseudoscience? The simple answer is, well, science is right. But oftentimes you can't know that until well after the fact. So how do you distinguish? Well, Talmadge and Witzow were actually trained in science. So they had, uh, you know, Talmadge in geology and chemistry, uh, Witzow in chemistry. And they had enough of a foot in that world that they were willing to take those things, that data, fairly seriously. For Joseph Fielding Smith, who did not have the equivalent of a high school education, he says this very bluntly, we can recognize true science because it agrees with what the Bible says. And I would insert, we can recognize true science because it agrees with my interpretation of what scripture says, because scripture is a science textbook revealed by God. That was what he thought. So they, they demarcated science differently. And Witzow and Talmadge saw these Christian fundamentalist books that Fielding Smith was reading, and they were saying, that's not really science but you can't tell that's not science because you don't have the training to recognize it. It was a question of expertise to some extent. But by 1954, there's no one left in the quorum who has that scientific expertise because they don't get replaced with scientists. And so at that point, there are numerous anecdotes. Um, Smith says, okay, they're gone, let's publish. Let's get this truth out there. And that's how it unrolls. Right. Yeah. I mean, I just remember, I mean, just want to talk about dating yourself. I just remember going back and when I really decided I was going to start studying, you know, kind of core of my mission first, but then later. And then back in the 90s, I was like, okay, what, what's the first thing I went to? Well, what I, it's what I knew at the time, right? And that was Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce R. McConkie. Yeah. And, and that's where you start. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, went a well beyond that later on, but, uh, um, I think, you know, one of my concerns just for fellow Latter-day Saints, those that have a, you know, the reason I think this is so important to get out there and to listen to you on this and others is because if you're building your faith, your testimony on this idea that, uh, uh, you know, this is a face value, you know, you're going to look at Genesis 1 and 2 as a, at face value, you're going to run into trouble more down the road. Very much so. And, and so you need to kind of take that hit a little bit and, and say, okay, well, because all of us, you know, we all want to protect our testimonies. We want to protect our faith. And that's important to do. And you have natural defenses for that. Yeah. But it shouldn't be built on anti-science. And, and, and it shouldn't be built on... Um, a, a literal or, or a face value 
uh, translation of, of Genesis 1 and 2. If you understand that these are written, again, I'm putting my own words in here, but written as drama. I, I think it's all written as drama. I think this is very similar to Job, right? I, I think that uh, uh, this, is, this is written for a ritual. I think that's what it's written for. And, and I think that, you know, if you look at that and you say, I'm supposed to participate in this, I'm Adam, I'm Eve, I, not only do you, do you not rely on the face value of it, but I think you get a lot more out of it. Yeah, I agree. Um, on a slightly different note, to your point that if we don't read it that way, if we do what I am calling a literal reading, mm-hmm. uh, that saves us a huge amount of problems. And I won't do it here, but I could name a number of people in the last 30 years who have left the church over this issue and caused major public harm. Mm -hmm. And some of it is, uh, it's harm that we have inflicted on ourselves as the church. Yes. Because, so the 1980 Old Testament Institute Manual, which is still the current Old Testament Institute Manual worldwide, translated into dozens of languages, quotes Joseph Fielding Smith that you have to choose between evolution and the gospel. And that kind of public false dichotomy has said, oh, well, if that's true, I choose science because that's well established and you're very clearly wrong. So I guess you weren't a a prophet. Mm -hmm. Uh, That is painful to admit uh, it is something we did to ourselves. Now, I've spent a lot of time trying to get into that mindset. I understand why Joseph Fielding Smith felt that way. For him, if evolution was true, then there was no atonement. There was no Jesus. The whole thing was entirely a sham. Everything rode on evolution and a young earth. Um, I disagree with that. And because I don't think those are valid presuppositions, and I can tell you why at length, his conclusion from those presuppositions is not remotely a threat to me. Mm -hmm. So I can look dispassionately at evolution and say, "Eh, it's got some problems, but there is, as Henry Eyring said, an awful lot of evidence in support of it. And that does not undermine my belief in the reality of Jesus and the atonement and, and all that stuff. But, for but Smith, that's hard to get out of your mind if that has been what you've always believed. Yeah. That it's, is, that is it's, hard to change. I spend a lot of time trying to work on people's presuppositions, their worldview, their, their assumptions that they might not even know they have. Because those are the things that generate those more conscious positions. Evolution undoes the atonement. Mm-hmm. So evolution must be evil, must be from Satan, can't be true. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's gotten negative connotations in some circles, but I am very much arguing for faith, very much an apologist in this sense. And what I argue, even though what I argue sounds very new to people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I've been allowed to present aspects of this at, at the Sperry Symposium, at, uh, Education Week at BYU, at the FAIR conferences, you know, very orthodox, vetted areas where I can introduce these ideas uh, in, in a safe place that has been vetted, you know. Right. Yeah, and that it, it needs to get out there more. I mean, I, you know, in the podcast, I, I go over this over and over again, even in the Come Follow Me stuff. I try, I try to relate everything back to Genesis 1 and 2. I, I want to go there as often as possible. I think people should. And, and, but I think that, uh, you know, one of the interpreters that I use in scriptures and trying to help people see through one of those lenses, as you say, is this, this idea of temple imagery and drama. And, and if, if we can look at some of this as, hey, this is how, this is how we participate in this. You know, I had, I had some, a commenter once on, on the podcast say something to the effect of, uh, we don't, you know, history doesn't mean anything unless we can participate in it in some way. Hmm. Hmm. And I think that's right. You yeah. know, I, I think that that's what the temple experience is. And, and it's, uh, this is about covenants. It's not science. It is theology. And theology isn't going to be written in the same way that a science textbook is, uh, is going to be written. I have one more question for you here before we end. Uh, yeah. There, uh, 
Is there any additional, as you would say, even today, you know, more of a Jewish context or how, how the Jews might look at Genesis 1 as, as compared to us? Uh, well, um, there's a saying, two Jews, three opinions. <laughs> uh, that is, there's, there's, there's rarely a single Jewish perspective on anything. Sure. Uh, but given that the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, is their book, and they've been reading it pretty closely for an awfully long time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I remember is um, there's a famous Jewish commenter from the medieval period named Nachmanides. And Nachmanides says, nothing in Genesis is literal. Hmm. Um, yeah. There are also Jewish fundamentalists who are young earth creationists. Uh, but, you know, you find much of what I have learned about Genesis that I've, that I've tried to recite here has come from reading Jewish scholars and Jewish sources simply because they have this long tradition of reading scripture very carefully, paying attention to details and, and inquiring into those details. Why is this the case? Why is it like this and not like that? Uh, if you've seen, I don't remember if it's one of my fireside videos or one of my posts. Oh, it's, one, it's my recent post about how long were Adam and Eve in the garden. Mm -hmm. The conclusions I come to in that post do not come from, from science or Jewish scholars. They come from paying very careful attention to details in the temple. And they're not details that are particular to this or that film. They're, they're not representational details that, okay. that you know, the director had to pick about, deliver the line this way or whatnot. Right. There, there are, if we pay attention, we learn a lot. And that's something I've picked up that's very simple, but from, from Jewish scholarship yeah. and approaches. Yeah. Appreciate that. Well, Man, really appreciate you coming on here and giving us, uh, filling in some gaps here, I hope, for, for a number of people here. And, and again, if you're, if you're someone, not you, Ben, but you know, the listeners here, if you have had a, a, you know, a strong uh, testimony that is built off of a literal or face value reading of Genesis 1 and 2, just, just consider this. This is not something that is a threat. Right. I, that's, that's the message I would want to give on this is this is not a threat to yeah. a testimony, right? This is exactly the opposite. This is, this is very faith promoting. And uh, I think allows you to have a little bit more uh, context and, and, and enriching understanding of, of uh, what's going on here with Genesis one and two. Ben, do you, anything else you wanted to go over? Well, quickly I, I should say two things. One, I love this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, Let's see. I think I've done 12 years of grad school working around this stuff okay. uh, that I, I got into through the Old Testament. And, you know, I did six years in Chicago in Semitics to get at the Old Testament. And, uh, but this is fascinating stuff. It's really interesting. It gets you into the scriptures and it's very rewarding. Uh, and the second one is this may not be necessary to say, but I will do it anyway, just for clarity. Uh, the things I say about Joseph Fielding Smith and Elder McConkie and so on, that they were wrong about certain things, doesn't undermine my respect or faith in them as apostles and prophets. Because being an apostle, being a prophet, being president of the church is not a theological guarantee that God will never allow them to say anything that's incorrect. What that is, is that when God chooses someone as an apostle, he gives them authority to steer the church. He does not download the mind of God into their own mind. There is plenty of diversity of thought among apostles. Um, so I, I argue with Joseph Fielding Smith all day long but at the end of the day, he's still a prophet. God chose him to lead the church and make decisions and do certain things. And I believe and respect that. But he's still wrong. Right. That doesn't undermine his prophethood. All right. I appreciate that clarification. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and, and it's kind of, you know, they, uh, 
who was it? It was uh, um, Iring. A few years back, he was talking to a reporter about how um, how discussions go among the oh, apostles. Yeah, and uh, he said, look, there's a lot of disagreement all the time. People have different ideas. They have different backgrounds. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, they'll come up with a unanimous decision if they're going to move yeah. forward on something. But that's how it works, right? They, they all have different ideas and they have different backgrounds and they're, they're uh, uh, very special men that are doing their best to move things forward and, and be, uh, trying to allow themselves to be open for, uh, for inspiration. So. And to that point, there's never been unanimity, unanimity about Genesis or evolution. Yes. And most people don't know that history, but there simply hasn't been. So yeah. I'm, I'm comfortable in what I'm saying. Great. Appreciate that, Ben. Hey, where can people go to get more information from you? I know you have a website. Yeah, my website is bensbackman.com. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do slash blog on that, you get a blog where I write gospel doctrine stuff and a bunch of other things. I also have a page on there on the menu on the left that has a link to all of my podcasts and videos and publications and some resource pages, but pretty much everything I do gets linked there one way or another. Okay. And, and, and perhaps uh, for people who are really interested at this point in that menu on the left, there's one that just says syllabus. And a couple months ago, I put together a syllabus where I organized a whole bunch of my posts and videos and things and said, if you want to study, Genesis interpretation and the temple work through these posts in this order. Okay. And I've gotten a lot of good feedback from that. Great. And do you, do you, do you, do you want to tell people what you're working on now? Uh, well, I'm writing my dissertation on uh, the intellectual roots of LDS creation evolution conflict in the 20th century. I've got a book manuscript on Genesis one and what it meant to the ancient Israelites. I'm guest editing a special issue of BYU Studies on biological evolution and LDS faith that we hope to have out in uh, January of 2021. I've got a couple of papers coming out about how Latter-day Saints read scripture and some other things like that. And uh, that might be it. I have about six major projects going on. I was gonna right say, now. that's it? That's all? I, what are you doing with your time? Yeah. Great, man. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Uh, maybe we'll grab lunch sometime. Be Thank you. Yeah, glad to be here.